got to do that for yeah yeah no worry do that Just got one minute. Cool. Okay, so I guess we shall start right now um so hey everyone i'm lindy and uh, our lovely ta mindy will also help us uh in the sections and uh without further ado uh, you guys probably already been to the last sections um so we'll just carry on with the stuff uh, we'll go through some new stuff and we'll go through some questions on the quiz and we'll also go through some questions um that will be in the assignments. Uh, so this time we're actually doing some uh, coding stuff. So if you're not too familiar with uh, calculus or if you're not too familiar with uh, coding, we'll go through all of, all of those stuff um, during this section. So don't be pressured, you'll be fine. And uh, this, this is just the agenda. Um, so first, we're going to recap some of the knowledge from last week because it will be recycled in today's sessions. And we're going to go through some quizzes and answer you guys' questions about that. Um, so the quizzes this time uh, for the second half of the first week is um, have a like really high rate of repetitions. So the questions tend to appear similarly. So I'll just go through some example of that and leave more time for the coding assignment, uh, which is the next uh, next thing on the agenda. So we're gonna go through some examples on the assignment questions, which I think that are uh, particularly valuable to go through because some of the assignment questions are just basically copy pasting from the uh, quiz and some of the uh, assignment question require a bit more thinking and um, yeah. um, so for the longer ones on the assignments, I wasn't able to go through all of those because I think the sessions will be a little bit too short. But uh, if you guys have a question about it, by all means, just uh, text me in Discord, send me an email. I'll just uh, help you through it or if um, there's a lot of uh, requests, I'll just include them in the next lecture, or I mean, the next session, not really a lecture. But um, the next one is uh, general Q&A sessions. So I'm uh, imagining you guys to have uh, more questions regarding this week's content, because there's indeed a much more significant, like th there's a significant portion of mathematic um, in this, uh, week's content. So if you guys are confused of anything, um, let me know and uh, we'll answer them here. Hopefully, hopefully I can answer them. So um, next one is, um, without further ado, let's just get started. To recap what's happening last week, uh, we basically um, learned the concept of deep learning. And uh, we also kind of kind of just talk about what is machine learning in general, and the key word in the concept of machine learning is adapt. Right, uh, adaptation is really important for machine learning. 
um, algorithm. Otherwise, it won't be able to, you know, like quote unquote learn. And uh, today's session, in today's session, we're actually going to talk about how neural network learns and how we use mathematics. Uh, um, how we use mathematics to allow that to happen. And also because I'll be writing a lot of things on my iPad and uh, coding something on my laptop. So um, I actually asked our lovely TA Mindy to send the, the slides beforehand in the chat so you guys can just follow along in the chats uh, during the sessions. And so if you want to make notes, uh, you can make notes on the slides and Hopefully that will help. If you have any questions, uh, I know last time I said, um, you know, like I have a linear processing mind. So if you have to break me off, break me off at the end of the page, but uh, we'll actually have, you know, um, we'll actually have a lot of mathematic content. And I think for me, you know, if I sleep for five minutes, maybe in my, in my linear algebra lectures, I won't be able to understand anything. So I think if you have any questions or any confusions, just maybe say in the chat and uh, Mindy will monitor it, answer questions, or uh, Mindy will just open her mic and let me know. And uh, we'll answer the question right away. So without further ado, um, this is just uh, what's, uh, what's happening in the last sessions we talked about. So. We're, u we're using your network to enable the deep, uh, deep learning. So the next uh, review was uh, what is a neuron? And uh, this concept is gonna keep appearing in basically any learning of your further, um, I guess, learning of uh, deep learning. <laughs> There's a lot of learning words. But anyway, so if you're gonna learn about deep learning is going to all basically every single it, it, there's always going to be neurons involved uh, specifically um it's going to be in this format so it's going to be some uh weight uh it's going to be some sort of weight i don't know if you guys can see my mouse you probably can't let me let me think if i can can you guys see my mouse or is it just is it just a plain diagram right here that your guys are Okay, you guys can see my mouse. Okay, cool. Uh, so you guys can see the mouse flying around <laughs> in my window. That's okay. Cool. So there's always going to be some sort of input called uh, x naught in this case, and timing of weight, and we pass it along in the cell body. Sometimes we do a little bit more operations in here. Maybe you know, like in a recurrent network, we're going to feed it for, we're going to feed it back. But uh, there's going to be uh, is, there's always going to be some sort of weight and you have time to some sort of inputs. And um, sometimes it's not summing. Sometimes it's uh, sometimes you like drop some of them. It's called drop out. Uh, we're going to learn those um, in the next sessions. So we're going to uh, sort of uh, combining all the inputs, uh, processed inputs using the weights and uh, put it through an activation functions. Uh, which also we talked about in the last session. So it's basically adding nonlinearity to the process data. And after that, we output it um, and use that as the input for the next layer of neural network, or in other case, it's just the output. So that's a um, recap for last week's knowledge. If you have any questions, just uh, break me off. I'll be answering them. And the next part is perceptrons. So this is just um, what I said in the previous slide, but with some um, multiple layers. So each uh, blue circle right here is actually a neuron. So that was some, um, so uh, how, how I can return to the last slide. Okay, so the circle right here, the cell body right here is actually um, what's happening in the diagram right now. So this is called a perceptron model. The first model that um, is going to be uh, included in the study group activities is actually a uh, multi-layer perceptron, MLP. So it's going to be some um, similar pro uh, uh, format that's similar to this diagram. So you're always going to see some sort of inputs connecting to middle 
um, hidden layers like the blue layer, uh, like the blue neurons right, right here. And it's like going layer and layer. And as we talked about last week, we're adding multiple decision boundary in this case. And after that, we're outputting it to one output. Sometimes we have more outputs, sometimes we have one output. And um, what, uh, what formats of your neural, neural network uh, and uh, what, uh, and specifically your problem statement kind of decides what, how many outputs you will have. And according to the number of outputs and um, the nature of the problem itself, you'll decide what loss function you will use, which is exactly what we're gonna talk about um, right here. So this is uh, some of the new stuff of this week. I know there's only two lectures that's included in the Coursera, but uh, the two lecture basically covers the base of neural networks. So how mathematically they will work out and um, how does neural network learn mathematically, of course. So that's, um, that's they spent like 20 minutes on it, but I, I just wish that we can have a bit more details and uh, hopefully you guys are familiar with calculus enough so um, the content appears clear to you guys. Okay, so now we talk about what is forward passing. Forward passing is kind of just exactly the same thing that I went through in the last two slides. So if we're looking at the perceptual model right here, forward passing is essentially we're starting from the inputs on the left side and uh, basically timing the input to the weights and uh, passing the process, the inputs into the next neuron. And after that, after all of these processing, hopefully the outputs that we came up is a reasonable one. That's essentially the workflow for um, for neural network. And uh, if we do if we do this properly, um, so I will do some meditation right here. I'm gonna do that. Um, sure. So as we see, this is the H, the HJ parameter is essentially the outputs from the neural network. And this is the weights that we just talked about and this is the input. And this is um, a vertical shift parameter. I know I didn't talk about it in the neural model, but uh, it's actually included. Uh, so if we go back, I don't know if, because um, I want you guys to make connection between uh, what is this and uh, the, the other diagram, because these two are actually absolutely the same. And um, the B right here is the vertical shift parameter because if you're looking at the decision boundary, like the diagram that I showed, that I show you guys uh, last week, um, they always start from the origin, but sometimes we don't want, we don't want that to happen, right? And um, if we have this parameter and we still want the decision boundary to go across the origin, we'll just have a zero right here. And uh, as what I just mentioned, the last slide about the neurons is actually exactly what's happening in this one. But this one is a much more broader pictures because um, you know uh, it doesn't show all the details of the connecting layers, but um, I'll explain to you what's happening. Yeah. So this is X train. So essentially when you're training, you're used to training data. Uh, we'll go through more about the training structures in the next session, but so far, um, just think of this as a bunch of inputs. So these are a bunch of uh, training inputs towards our neural network layers. And our neural net, whoops, <laughs> I disabled the annotation. Yeah, that's right again. And uh, out of these parts, not including the, the, this part, not including this part, are neural network. These are actually a neural network. Specifically, these are a multiple layer perceptual model, um, uh, fully connected layers. So you have these type of inputs and uh, it's uh, ranging from like zero, one, two, three, four. And, uh, you call each of this parameter xi as uh, shown right here. 
So the I refers to the roles and, um, or in this case, um, X, I, X, I, J, actually, just kidding. I think uh, the notation right here, it just means that uh, X, I just means um, in the column I is the X input. But uh, when we're connecting it, um, where is it? I time I J wait I J no just kidding yeah it's referring to the rows uh, how do I know that because we're gonna talk about the weights um so if the I refers to rows in the training data and the J refers to the rows in here when we're connecting layers um the weights in the middle is essentially the edges between two and node one here and one here right. So we, if we got a time goes to, if we're gonna multiply those two, we would have to know the, the rows. We, have, we would have to know the index, which in this case, this is um, zero, and in this, this case is also zero. So in this case, the i will be zero and j will also be zero. So this is actually weight zero, zero. Weight x, um, weight, yeah, weight zero, zero. And if we time those together, we're gonna get um, some sort of, um, um, process inputs that showed uh, previously in the neuron diagram, which is we are timing the input X to the weight W, right? And uh, after that, we're going to add uh, a vertical shift uh, parameter um, B right here. So that's just going to be simply added, adding, sorry, adding to the multiplied product. And uh, later, we're going to pass that to the F which is an activation function right here and pass this hj parameter. So after you, pro after you process it, for example, if we're processing this one and we also have this one, we have like a bunch of connecting, well, well okay, we have a bunch of connecting layers and we're, if we're um, summing this together at this parameters right here, um, this sum together and uh, activated uh, product is gonna call HJ. So we're just using that as a as a reference to the intermediate layers. So hopefully that makes a bit more. So hopefully, hopefully that will make <laughs> help you guys to understand the diagram a bit more and um, um, get clearer about uh, the neural network structures. But uh, the most important part of this diagram that I want to say is, uh, is actually not how parameters are passing forward and, um, um, and you know, summing together, because that's just simply mathematics, right? How does that allow our network to learn? Uh, the actual emphasis that I want to make is right here. This loss function is actually what's um, what's happening, really happening um, in this neural network, because we're going to use this to enable the learning process of uh, of the whole structure. So, for example, um, if I'm helping you guys to understand this, this is the prediction model made by your neural network. So, in this case, it produces uh, a black square, for example. And this is the true label, X target. So this is how you want the data to look like. So in supervised learning, we're always gonna have some sort of true labeling about data. So for example, if you have a diagram of a dog and uh, you you also have some, some sort of diagrams of a, a cat. So if you're passing through it to your neural network, and your network predict, uh, predict, predict the dog to become a cat. So how will you know it? The loss function enables you to understand that because uh, essentially uh, what it is doing is that it's comparing your predicted output to the targets and uh, say, okay, how far are you from the real prediction? That's what the loss function is doing. And, um, after you understand, so after you putting it into the loss functions, it will result in some sort of output called error slash loss. So this is the um, any product you're getting from your comparison in the loss functions. And using that, you will go back, which is 
Next slide. You are going back to your network and update your weight and uh, maybe not your input because your input is uh, likely going to be different each time because you don't want your network to over adapt to your training batch. But, uh, um, but when you're passing it back, you're updating your W parameter to, um, to, to uh, enable your network essentially to learn because what's happening if you update W parameter is that uh, each time we are going through this process again, you're using uh, a better W right here. And hopefully the summation will make a bit more, uh, sorry. Okay, so if we're gonna sum, uh, sorry, if after the updates, uh, the WIG is gonna become a better parameter. That's, uh, that's it means that if we go through all of this uh, middle layer, the producing outputs essentially is gonna be produce a less loss right here. So uh, what I mean right here, I don't know if it makes perfect sense for you guys, it, mean, uh, it means that every single, so previously, after we do the summation and multiplying uh, process, we're gonna produce some sort of outputs. But this time we're using the difference between our produced outputs to the ideal outputs to going back and update the parameters. And after the updates, we hopefully can produce a better set of weights that enable us to, do, uh, to be better at our jobs, which is uh, in this, in the example that I just gave out is a classification problem because we're classifying a uh, dog and cat. But sometimes that's kind of different because sometimes we want to create a new diagram, a new pictures of uh, people or animals. And sometimes we want to, you know, understand what's the meaning of this, uh, of the context of the sentence, you know. So sometimes, uh, so this loss functions and the way you update it, um, and the way you traverse them through your diagram actually varies according to the type of neural network that you're using. But in general, if you're looking at this, um, this is a multi-layer conception model and uh, basically every single neural network architecture is gonna have some similarity to this because this is uh, what we first came up with and uh, what used as you know, the base. Okay, so let's move a little bit forward. And yay, we got to some of the math parts. So um, yeah, these are some uh, common loss function that's seen on the, you know, like on the market right now. Actually, it's not on the market. It's, it's just used everywhere. It's a uh, mean square error. Sometimes I forgot to put the cross entropy on there. It's also, that's also one of, uh, one of, that's also one of the very common used uh, loss functions. These uh, MSE stand for mean square error, and AE means mean absolute error. And uh, this is just, uh, I think, is this quadrant? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, this is cross entropy. I should put it on. Yeah. And uh, here is uh, what I want to take a break to the lecture. And actually I want us to start encoding for a little bit because um, uh, first I want you guys to get familiar with the Python language. And the second part is that uh, this is actually um, on your assignments. So I can kind of just uh, mash the assignment analysis session to, um, to what's happening in the lecture. So, this is my pie charm. This is my IDE, integrated development um, IDE environment. So, sorry. So, uh, this is what I use to code. And um, basically, just uh, think of this as a text editor. It's like an up upgraded version of a Word document, you know? So, um, for the first question I want to go through um, in the first question I want to go through for the um, sessions today, we're going to actually code 
these uh, these laws function. I don't know how how I can do. Sorry, just give me a second, and I'll figure this out. I'm actually quit the slides and put these on the website. Error. Okay. Where is my Zoom? Oh shoot, I'm so lost. <laughs> Where is my Zoom? Oh, it's so my so it's in the corner. Shoot. Okay. So Windows, show Windows. I just want to show you guys my text editor. I mean my PyCharm. Okay, cool. That's perfect. That's perfect. And let me just make this a little bit smaller so maybe it's easier for you guys to see them. Um. So, uh, does anyone have been done coding before, like in Python? Just uh, a general, out of my general curiosity. And uh, yes, yes, okay. Does anyone haven't tried with Python coding before? Or like, does anyone have experience with like C++, C, but haven't tried Python before? No? All right, cool. So I can just dive into this without worrying too much and uh, um, let me know if the font is too small, I'll adjust it and uh, we're, we're going through this process. Um, so let me, so uh, this is actually on your home or one and uh, it's the problem 2D. It's the part B of your question too. So it's asking you to, um, Right, the loss function of uh, mean square error is asking you to produce the loss function of mean absolute error. And it's asking you to produce the loss function for hinge error. So um, I'll just be coding for mean square error and mean absolute error because uh, hinge is essentially just uh, like a max functions. And uh, I don't want, uh, I wanted to leave a bit of um, space of experiment for you guys. So um, I'll just do the two, um, the first one, the second one, and leave the third one to you guys. And after that, we're gonna actually test to see if our loss function actually works. And hopefully this will help you guys understand a bit more how loss function measure the difference between, I guess, its inputs and the, its, its true labels. So um, how can I do this? Uh, because I want to show the questions as well as my coding interfaces, but uh, it seems like it's not quite working right now. So I'll just code and maybe I'll retype the functions um, if that's possible, because I just showed the functions on my on my uh, slides, but it's not actually uh, on the screen right now because I have to show my coding interface. So if you guys have any confusion regarding the math part, let me know. I'll explain them again. So let's actually start with uh, one of the um, easy one. Let's start with the mean square error. Okay. So let me move this away from the screen. Cool. So the question part D, D one. Uh, this means that you're going to implement uh, the MSC mean square error. So what's happening right here is uh, first I'm going to define a function uh, that's just going to simply do the mathematical expression right here. So I'm going to just do def. That means define, define functions. And um, the function signature that's giving the problem statement is uh, mean square error. So that's what's uh, given. And the two local parameter that will be h hat and uh, I mean y hat and y. So these two are 
uh, the two inputs uh, parameter that we want to use. So specifically, um, so specifically, the white hat means that this is the true labels of the of the input data, and y is the input data. So um, essentially, we want to produce uh, these of uh, these process um, in like batches. So we will also use NumPy in this case, import NumPy as MP to essentially, I don't want to use a for loop to go through it like for I in range, you know, I don't want to go through it one by one by one. So I can use NumPy to uh, do the mean square, calculate the mean square error for an array. And then I don't have to write a for loop myself. I only have to pass in the parameter once, okay? So um, it's gonna be really easy because uh, mean square error, if I'm, uh, if I, how can I show both of my screen? Can I show on the left and show on the right? Because I, I really want you guys to see the equations when I'm coding. I think it will also make a bit more sense. Um, let me think how I can do this. Share, share screen maybe, whoa. Okay, I'm so confused. Okay, uh, screen one, screen two. Actually, I'll just hold share the whole screen. It's fine. And I'll open my notes on the right. My notes on the right. So whenever you guys see me staring at your guys, that means I'm actually checking my answer that I crafted out last night. <laughs> anyway. So in this case, uh, if you see it, the mean square error is essentially you're just subtracting your prediction to the y hat over here. So the y hat is the true label, and uh, the y i parameter was the input uh, uh, was the output parameter. And uh, by subtracting them, you're measuring the difference. And because sometimes those difference could be positive, could be negative, and you want the consistency because you don't want um, so for example, if, uh, if to, what, this parameter is off by the true prediction by maybe like 1,000 and the other one was off by negative 1,000, that's a really large number. Typically, you will not see that. And uh, uh, you don't want those two results to be canceled because both of them are not right. That means your weight is really, really bad. But if you just simply add those differences together, they will get add to zero. That means that you have a, you have a zero loss, that means you have zero error. So that means like you have a really good set of parameters. You want that to happen because you want every single um, bad things to be penalized, right? So in this case, uh, in this case, we're squaring them because what does squaring do? It uh, makes everything positive, right? And uh, by Averaging those because you will have a lot of um, inputs parameters. Sometimes um, the training data sets can be, you know, like 10,000, 100,000 and stuff. So uh, you have a lot of them. So you would need to average them. But your training batch will not be that big. Um, so in this case, I'll just do return. Uh, it's really easy because we're using NumPy right here. So this is actually really convenient for you guys for uh, for us to do whoops, um, for us to do because uh, in this case we just need to square and uh, subtract 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 if only I can type okay and uh, I will pass in the y hat right here which is going to be a numpy array uh, or list I don't know um, probably a numpy and uh, the y right here. So we're subtracting the y from the y hat. So we're subtracting over, as we see right here, we're subtracting the ink outputs from the predicted uh, true labels and we're squaring them. And what was left as the last step is we're gonna take the means. Really? Okay. My laptop is uh, just, just froze. I was, uh, I was a bit nervous. It's been nervous when that happens. Hopefully it won't break down. Okay, 
So right here, um, we have our mean square error section. It's, it's, this function is literally only one line, so don't overthink it. And uh, hopefully I can just uh, show you guys uh, how it's gonna work out in the next few minutes. So I'm gonna do if name. So I'm gonna do if name equals to main. Type right here. So how do you use a loss function? That is the question, right? If you look at the function signature right here, and also the diagram that I just show you guys, I was not sharing the right screen, right? I was sharing, I was actually sharing my answers, guys. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Now you guys see all the answers, but um, but we're still gonna go through them. Are you uh wait, this is my screen. Yes, this is my screen. Okay. Is that my screen? That's not my screen. Okay. Let me try again. Wait, which one? Which one of them is my screen? This one is my screen. Was I sharing my answer? I have no idea. Okay. Um, would Y hat and Y be list? Um, it's a form of list. So uh, because we use NumPy library right here, so what does NumPy do is that it treats data from a really low level and uh, sometimes uh, it, it utilizes uh, your, um, your processors better. So it's going to be much faster if you do uh, the encoding yourself. For example, you create your own list and use a formula to traverse through. So that's why we use NumPy sometimes. And also it's more convenient because uh, if here, if I'm just creating a list, I will have to do for I in range, you know, like the, the length of the list. And uh, and and in, in which we're gonna do like mean square error, everything. Right, and we don't want to. I don't. We don't want that to happen because uh, that's slow and also more work for you to do. So in this case, uh, for for the per like just um for the convenience, I'm just gonna. I am just gonna create two NumPy array. So NumPy array essentially works exactly the same as list because it's a list of values. But uh, the difference is that you can first you can use NumPy array to uh, you, uh, you can use NumPy functions to process those, and the second part is that um, uh, sometimes NumPy can also do matrix multiplication, so uh, it's also easier for you to um, to just use the library. So in this case, we have two array right here. So before. Uh, before going to the next step, we're just going to see how, um, how, what does this mean and what does this mean? So this is actually handcrafted by me. So I'm not even sure if they add up to one. Um, so these are actually the logits, uh, not the logits. These are actually the probability of uh, each one hot, uh, one hot encoding. Have you guys heard, uh, have you, have you guys heard of the, um, one hot encoding before, or is that the first time that you guys are here? Nope. Okay. First time. Okay. So we'll just uh, first time. Cool. So one hot encoding essentially is. Um, I'll just type it down. One hot encoding. Encoding. I didn't include it on the slide because I think. Um, it's actually a really easy concept. So um, one hot encoding, if you just interpret it from the, you know, from the uh, surface meaning of it, it means that only one of them are hot. So uh, this is actually one hot encoding, but this is not because we sometimes we only want one of those values to stand out. So maybe sometimes we're using this to masking something or uh, to represent that among all of the classification, we only want, um, we, we don't want any ambi ambiguity. We just want the correct one to stand out and kind of just hide those, uh, 
non-correct values. So in that case, that's actually what's happening right here. So this is the actual um, one hot encoding. Or um, sometimes uh, if we look at the loss function on the right here, um, the one hot encoding is actually true label because if I say, and I'm gonna classify, so maybe imagine this uh, as we have five type of animal right here. And the third type of animal is a uh, stock, okay? So if we're looking at one pictures, we wouldn't say, okay, this picture looks like cat and dog because a dog is a dog, a cat is a cat. We don't wanna confuse those. So we're only setting one um, true label in among out of the entries, in among out of the indexes to make it clear that, um, okay, this is the dog. This is not cat, it's not pandas, it's not snake, it's a dog, okay? That means, uh, that, means that we're essentially using only one of the entry to, uh, to express that uh, it's, you know, like the one and only choice at all. And uh, another usage of one hot encoding, sometimes you can see that is uh, it's used for masking. So if I just simply multiply um, pairwise between the old layer, output layer, that means, and the actual uh, arrays, if I just multiply those two, um, I will get a result of 0 0.031. So that's actually the only right outputs uh, from our predicted value. So for example, sometimes we don't want um, the result produced by our algorithm for all the other entries, but only want the one only uh, uh, entries from the true label. In other case, we're only um, we're only wanting to make um, judgments based on how our algorithm is doing on the actual correct um, correct output. So if we're if we, if we want to do that, we sometimes use uh, one hot encoding to mask it. But in this case, um, we won't do that because we actually have the loss functions and uh, we want to penalize for those um, wrong judgments and award the, award the correct, um, correct predictions, right? So in that case, what we'll do is actually just um, first, first, First of all, I would uh, need to output uh, the both of the arrays to, to just show you guys that uh, those two are um, those two are there. I'll just copy and paste because that's actually just a lot of work to type and I'm absolutely too lazy to do that. And I kind of want to move on to the next sessions in a few minutes. So we'll do this fast. And uh, I will do the prints right here. And mean squared. Oh, it's mean squared there. I typed it wrong. So this is mean squared error. And uh, we're going to compare it uh, between the outputs layer and the actual layers and uh, using our own very um, unique defined function. <laughs> and uh, we're going to see how much it will produce. So um, in this case, I keep it all below one. So uh, because the one hot encoding, the maximum um, number is going to be one. So usually what you will see in your neural network output layer is that every single um, one of the outputs will also be capped to one. So capped uh, below one. And typically those are the probability of each predicted entry so that you can compare this with the one caught encoding, right? You don't want the, uh, you don't want this to be like 10,000, but uh, you, you don't want this to be 10,000, maybe like 100, because if you do that using the mean square error, essentially you're gonna have really low, really high loss, even though like this, this thing, 0 0.79 and 0 0.031, it's also a big difference because we're using a zero to one range, but sometimes if you don't cap this, uh, your loss, you, you lose the relativity of your loss function. So usually for the off layer, we use another activation functions or processing functions to cap or to modify the uh, usually sigmoid sometimes. Um, sometimes if you use like uh, process entropy, you also use like, um, logarithm and like something something like that to so just cap your inputs between a certain range. And in this case, we're capping it between zero and one. 
um, because it's handcrafted by me. I said it's between zero and one. It's got to be zero and one. So, <laughs> so if I'm going to output this value, so can anyone um, say in the chat that uh, maybe predicted, do you think uh, the two input right here would produce a really good loss? Just simply like, yes or no, it's fine. Take a guess. Probably not. No. No. Yes. Yes. It's a, the answer is uh, it's no. You're you're very correct because um if we're comparing these values 0 0.031 0 0.14 what stand out the most the first entry right that essentially means uh for our alpha layers our network's predictions uh, is that the first entry is actually um, what we wanted and all the others, it's very unlikely to be in these indexes, right? But uh, according to true label, what's the correct entry? Is the third entry right here. So there's actually inconsistencies. And we are we just hope that we really, really hope that our loss function will produce a big loss for this so that our new network can go back and uh produce a better set of weights. So that means that this mean square error, we really hope it to work. So if we run this, uh, and I think it hide it, not in the terminal, maybe in the run. Yeah, it's in the run. Okay. So now we see we're producing a mean square error loss of 0.32-ish, uh, okay? So this is a, uh, not a really good loss. This is not a really good loss because uh, as we've seen previously, the maximum value for the loss is like one because uh, we're squaring it and our input is capped uh, between zero and one. But uh, this is actually 0.3. So that's actually quite large. And um, if we want to see how our program works, this is actually another thing that I can do to test it, to um, do it one, maybe. And uh, 0 0.031, I'll just put it here, and I'll make this 0 0.7. So now this set of um, um, values, this set of uh, values will actually produce a better loss, hopefully. And uh, we can check, we can, uh, we can check it by doing this. We'll print it again and uh, loss set to, I'll just set to, and uh, I would have to change that. Uh, but we don't change the actual labels because we just want to compare the upper layers uh, values to the actual labels. So we have two set over here. So what we're hoping to see is that the second output right here, so if there's going to be a second line printed here, it's gonna be smaller than the first printed lines. And let's see. Um, can I do rerun? Yeah. And the second set of laws that we now produced is 0 0.01. So I think it's pretty obvious that this is uh, much better than the first set of weights. Cool. Uh, does anyone has any more problem about loss loss functions, uh, or is everyone clear on this concept? Do you have any questions? Because we're gonna do a, a more calculus in the following maybe fifteen minutes, and then we'll do some more fun coding. But uh, but but uh, we're gonna say bye to coding for now. But do you have any more questions to this? No. No? Okay. Um, I know I said I'm going to do MSC and I'm going to do the MAE, but MAE is really, really easy to. So instead of doing the square here, you're just doing absolute. So there is essentially no difference in the structure of the functions. You just need to copy and paste it. And that's literally the second one. And the third one, you're just using a max function. So it's also not too difficult. So for these loss functions, uh, hopefully you guys are going to quickly just uh, 
you know, solve those questions in the assignment, have no problem with it. But if you have any questions, let me know. And uh, I'll talk more about programming next time. Okay, so let's actually uh, go back to lectures. Sure, that's the loss function. Does anyone have uh, more questions regarding it? Or is that, is that good? Sorry, this is actually the questions. I was going to show you guys, but I figured that I cannot code and show you guys the question at the same time. So that screwed me up, but <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, maybe met, maybe better, better planning next time. So we're getting the fun stuff. So this is the pack back propagation. So usually when do we use it? We use it all the time because this is exactly what our network do to produce a better set of weights. I know I've said that many times and I show you the loss functions, but this is actually the update process that we're going to go through. And uh, this is essentially the core, the, the spirit of, uh, of a neural network, because um, this is how you can adjust the weights using mathematics. So mathematics is uh, becoming more and more important here. So uh, without me writing too much on the screen, I want, uh, I want to just uh, maybe produce a surface level understanding of uh, this function right here. So this is how we update the weight because uh, as you see, we're taking the old weight, I'm subtracting some sort of uh, parameter to it and producing the new things. So the subtracted parameters, if we're, so uh, if, if we're trying to interpret it is um, a multiplied product between an alpha variable right here and a partial derivative of the loss function. So as I just mentioned, what is the loss function? Loss function is essentially how you measure the difference between your uh, predicted value as, as well as your true label. And I also show you through the codes, right? So that's hopefully help you understand how this loss function works. If you are still confused about the concept of loss function, think about it as, um, think about it as an error, error of your predictions. So we're taking the derivative of our error of predictions and timing it by an alpha value. So let's just ignore the alpha value right now and just um, talk about what is derivative. I know if, you, if you're in first year, you probably already <laughs> take a lot of cal calculated courses that include the concept of derivative. So if we have to interpret it, uh, what is um, di L and di W I G, essentially, it's uh, meaning the rate of changes, right? The rate of changes regarding what? Um, so if you're in first year, you probably haven't learned the concept of partial derivative right now. But uh, partial derivative is essentially a similar concept to derivative, but uh, you have multi-variables. So you have more variables. But uh, in this case, uh, we have a variable named wij. So if we're gonna update, only update the weight called wij, we don't want, uh, we, we want to update according to what? According to the extent of this variable, uh, of the extent of impact on the loss function from only this weight variable, okay? You only want to update the degree. Uh, so for example, if you have a large, if you have um, large loss, but all your parameter, all the other parameter are great, but only one of your weights are off. But um, when you are updating the other parameters, um, you want to know how much does this weight influence it and ignoring the other, uh, the contribution from the other weights. And how we do that, we use the partial derivative. And um, by doing this, we're, up, we're multiplying this, um, this rate of changes. So this error rate by a step, step variable right here. So this alpha variable, essentially how much we're changing it. Sometimes in the neural network, we also call this learning rate. It's really important because if you change it too much, sometimes you may overdo it. And if you do it too literally, if you, if you like use a really, really small 
um, alpha variable right here, your update may be too small. That's, it seems like it's not making any impact on your loss function sometimes even. But uh, um, if you use uh, a small function, a, a small variable, alpha variable, sometimes it also means that uh, you're gonna do it multiple times to reach the results uh, of using a larger variable. So this is actually a design choice by you, but uh, we're gonna cover more about it in the next sessions. Next sessions is not gonna be very computational and heavy. Uh, like this one, but um, we're going to talk about more fun stuff, like how do you actually construct a neural right network, how do you construct a training loop, such as uh, things like that. But this time, we're actually looking at, at um, this learning rate variable right here, and just saying that we're updating this much and uh, using using our error rate. So how, how off is this uh, weight parameter? Um, does that make sense for you guys, or um, that too confusing? If it makes sense, just text. If you don't, if you're not confused, don't text. Oh, okay, nobody is confused. So let's get to the next part, which is chain rule. Uh, just to make sure, does anyone not familiar with the concept of chain rule? Like, um, because if, if you're not confused, I won't spend time explaining what is the chain rule, and I will not give you an example of the chain rule. Because, yeah, it will actually take time for me to do that. No, no, okay. So what does uh? So what does chain rule do? Is that uh? in your neural network, you will actually have uh, functions that's uh, big because you're, um, you're, adding, uh, you're adding stuff, you're, you're multiplying stuff, and you're putting it through activation functions for almost every single layer of your neural network. And in the end, you're going to have a really long embedded functions with, uh, with functions in another function, in another functions. And the, your update parameter is actually parameters of uh, those embedded functions, which is going to bury really deep in, in the long equations. So if we're going to have something like that, um, it's very important for us to understand um, how we can use chain rule to simplify the process. The lecture gave you an example of, um, of chain rule using a sigmoid functions. Uh, which is which is could be used as one of the activation functions. So it's it's usually um, the lecture used that example to give you a sense of how chain rules can be employed to solve questions like those. But uh, the questions of a uh, neural network, sorry, uh, and it's it's usually it, it only gave you the example using one layers uh, because that's most basic, and then you don't have to do a lot of math like. Um, this is uh, if you're if you're actually coding your ne your network using PyTorch or TensorFlow, you won't be calculating those keychain rules by yourself because the library does it for you, and I pretty much can guarantee you it does it faster than you. So um, I know sometimes sometimes people are just thinking why we're doing this right now, but I think this is actually very important for you to understand how uh, the parameters in the network actually. Um, updates and hopefully later when you're um, coding your own network and you're stuck at a local minimum, for example, you can use um, chain rules and you can use the basic knowledge to kind of just uh, uh, think your way through the process and produce a better network, okay? But this is a chain rule. If nobody is confused about it, um, I will just move on and to the computation graph um, and uh, kind of just show you how chain rule is uh, done in those case. No? Okay, sure. So uh, the computation graph, it's uh, essentially a way to visualize the adding and the mathematical operations. So you have the X, Y, Z inputs, you're adding the X, Y together to form another variable of Q. 
and uh, you have another variable called z, and you're multiplying those to form a variable of uh, f, and that's ending to be negative 12. So this is a very, very simple example from the lectures, but um, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, whoops. Okay, if we're gonna um, draw something out here, or if we're gonna, um, if we're gonna annotate it, I want uh, you guys to understand a little bit more about how uh, functions are kind of just like embedded into each other. So the Q is uh, a function, if I can type, if only I can write, okay. Whoops, it's not that it be here, okay. Maybe I change the color. Can I do it now? Okay. Yeah, it's not like it needs to draw. Um, so what I'm what I was going to write on the screen is actually I was going to say Q is a uh, product is a summation product from the input variable x and y. So if we're going to do the partial derivative of this uh, is uh, the x, the x, how x and y influence it is actually we're going to see the, um, the, it, the partial derivative of q is formed by both of the x and y. But if we're taking um, Q respect to X, the Y doesn't matter anymore. I was just going to show you that on the screen mathematically, but I can't, right? Let me just try one more time. Yeah, I can. <laughs> That's okay. That's a, it's a very simple comp. It's a really, really simple comp concept. And, uh, um, but for those of you that in first year, partial derivative may seem a little bit uh, confusing. So I, Yes, uh, I guess I will, if I cannot write, I guess I'll just uh, move it to the next one. But uh, later we're gonna do questions that's kind of involved, involved in the partial through the concept. And uh, it's, it's only possible for you guys to understand the whole architectures um, with the concept of partial derivative and changes. But, because I can't write. Yeah, I can't. <sighs> Damn it. That's okay. <laughs> um, for the computation graph right here, this is just an advanced version of this. It's more branches and it's involved with uh, the parameter exponent and uh, one over X. And um, if I can write on the screen, I will show you how to go back propagates the whole graph. Um, this is, um, so you might be wondering if we can just do that mathematically. Um, just try. Yes, I could do that. Actually, actually, I think um, I'll just do the example in the later quiz session so that uh, I can show the chain rules on the way there. But um, so for, for the computation graph, um, it's usually, a graph composed of mathematical you know, parameters and also operations. What it is used for is that it's actually used for computer to paralyze its calculation so that it's much faster for it to run. So what does it mean is that, you know, like you can see these branches of multiplying, like multiplying this and multiplying that and you add them together. But if you only look at these functions, you kind of, your brain is kind of going in like series. Like it's not in parallel because when you're looking at this functions, you are timing the cat, you're timing them together. And then you're going to the next one. You're, you're multiplying this together. And then you're adding these three together. You know, like as you, if you see this uh, functions, you're kind of going it in series. You're going step by step. But for computer, if you have these uh, multiplying um, process that absolutely need to do before this uh, addition uh, one, you could essentially just uh, produce these two results in parallel. That's if you have the time of just adding them. And if you have thousands or tens of thousands of these type of parameters, imagine how many time you will save by that. 
But that being said, uh, your computer resources is also a limitation. So um, just looking, just looking at this and saying that if we produce like tens of thousands of branches, our computer will be sped up by um, tens of thousand times. That's that will not happen because your your resources is limited. But uh, if you do this type of computation graph, uh, TensorFlow use this and. Um, it will make your calculation much more faster. And there's also one assignment questions on the programming assignments that's basically going to ask you to produce this type of graph and use um, this graph propagating from the uh, last uh, term and uh, and then backwards. Uh, how can that allow you to have better parameters? But um, essentially, it's very, very similar ideas um, with uh, with derivative and uh, you're just gonna calculate like derivative and make that a Python function. Essentially one line, one or two lines are okay for you to, um, to complete uh, uh, the questions. And it's uh, divided in many little parts and it's a very long questions. So you have to do this step by step by step, but uh, hopefully you guys are gonna have a good time with those. <laughs> and you have any questions, let me know. And if you are really stuck on one of the longer questions, uh, shoot me an email and I will talk about that in the next session because next section is basically gonna be a hybrid from week one materials, uh, specific programming assignments and with week two quizzes and programming assignments. So um, we're gonna talk about this anyway. So if you have any questions, let me know. Cool. And uh, I know I said it's going to be mathematic uh, heavy, but because I didn't go through the chain rule stuff, uh, whoops, well, we are at the quiz stage. <sighs> so actually, I think we'll just use the quiz to help you guys to understand um, uh, <laughs> the mathematics. Okay, let's, let's try to do this. And uh, so, um, you guys, since you guys already have the slide, uh, I'll just uh, close my screen sharing and uh, put on my iPad so it's so that I can actually write something uh, when when I'm not uh, mandatory to show my screen. So let me see, iPhone, iPad, please work. Does it work? Um, can you guys see the screen off my iPad? Where are the slides? Um, Mindy, can you send the slides in the chat again? Um, the slides will also be uploaded uh, to the website um, a short bit after these sessions. I know last time we said a short bit, <laughs> a short bit, it took us uh, a few days to complete it, but uh, this time we'll try our best to be faster. So this is um, this is my iPad screen. Okay. So given the problem statement, uh, we're giving input X and the weight matrix for X to H and also the weight matrix for H to A. Um, so uh, just for the purpose of this question, I'll just reload it. Um, if you look at the diagram that's provided on the slides over there, um, essentially it's going to be uh, an input layer like this. This is the input. And so uh, we have um, one middle neural, net, uh, neural network layer, so one hidden layer. And one output. So called A. So this layer, middle, middle hidden layer, we'll just call it H and the input we call it X. So X is equals to X1 and X2 because we, we have like two, this is X1 and X2. And for hidden layer, we have three parameter. So we call it H1, H2 and H3. Okay, we'll call it H. So H is composed of H1, H2, and H3. And the output is just one, very simple. So it's just A. And um, notice that it's saying that H and, oops. 
a half sigmoid activation function. Uh, which we talk about in the last sessions as one of the type of the activation functions. So um, to do that, um, the question is, is asking you, what is the second element in the hidden layer output vector? <laughs> Later is also going to ask you another question, be like, what is the output? But if we calculate it, I mean, you get everything. <laughs> so it's essentially the same question. So I just put this question on here. So. It give, it's given that uh, the proper statement, right, x is equal to one and negative one. It's in a matrix format. So um, if you court, if you kind of just compare this matrix to the diagram, uh, the first one is going to be x one, the second one is going to be x two. Okay, it's very straightforward. And this w x is going to be. Um, one over x, uh, zero, one, one over x, one, zero. Okay. And wh right here is going to be negative one, one over two, one over two. Okay. If we have this, uh, now we go back to this diagram right here. And can we just interpret which weight we're using and to connecting to which node? And uh, hopefully after this example, you guys will be uh, clear enough to solve questions that, you know, that ask you to go forward. So how do you do it? Is that um, the WX, the WX, we have two columns right here. One of them has a one or two, zero, one, one of two, one of them is one or two, one, zero. And I think it's pretty obvious because if we, Kind of just correspond that to the x element. Um, if we do, for example, if we put the weight in the format of w x i j, okay, so i is gonna be um, i is gonna be what uh, row it is in, and j is gonna be what column it is in. And in this case, if we're looking at this, um, if we're timing by this, it's really clear that uh, if we make these connection, this will be one over two, this will be zero, this will be the one, right? Because um, the matrix formats corresponds to each other. And uh, the other thing is the same. So the other one is a one over two, one, zero. So if we're asked to kind of just uh, show the matrix multiplication and ask what is the second element in the hidden layer outputs parameters, um, is first we will write um, the the total outputs equation, which is f equals to an activation function, which is sigmoid. Uh, sorry, I have really bad handwriting. <laughs> and uh, here we're just gonna do w i j time w um, i j time w i actually w j x j. And uh, because in this case we don't have a b parameter. So we don't consider, usually we add it here, but I think for the sake of simplicity of the question, they take it out. So after doing this, you will get the H, H element. And if you're gonna do it again, in the second part of the question, it asks you what is the element of A? So essentially you need to calculate H1, H2, and H3. H1, H2, and H3. And you're gonna summate uh, after, you are gonna substitute this xj into h1 and be like, maybe try like be like y1 equals to sigmoid w h w x um ij and time it by the hj without the b forever. Usually again, usually we include it, but in this case we don't. Uh, and this is not A, this is sigma. And we do it three times, Y1, Y2, Y3. And we'll sum them together to get A. And this, by summing those together, uh, yeah, we don't need to sum them together. Essentially, I mean, you get the H1 and H2. 
using the X J. But uh, if you look at the diagram right here, after you completing X one and W one, you get uh, a multiplied product. But in order to get H one, you essentially need to sum the multiplied pro product by X one and W X one one, and uh, plus the multiplied product of X two time W X two three. So you do it two times, but with this diagram structure, this question is actually really easy because you can just uh, forward propagate through all of them. And with that being said, I think uh, hopefully that provides enough instruction for you guys. Um, I could also just work on these questions. Uh, I'll just I'll just solve it really quick. So what's the second element in the hidden outputs layer? If we just look at the diagram right here, we can see that. Essentially, we just need the X1 to H2 connection and the H X2 to H2 connection. So in order to do that, it's just we use one time. Um, so what is the X1 to H2? It is zero, right? It's zero because uh, we see the X WX matrix right here is one of one of two for WX11, one, one, one of two for WX12, and one over uh, and one for wx13. So if we're looking at what wx12, it's zero. So one plus zero, one times zero plus um, x2 is negative one. And we time it by wx22, which is one. So that's zero minus one, negative one. But uh, for negative one, you need to put it through the sigmoid function, which is uh, sigmoid function is one over one minus e2 x. So if we calculate 1 over 1 minus x is negative 1, if we do that, it's just 1 minus e. Oops. Sorry, I'm writing it too closely. And if we calculate that, which I haven't done for, um, before this, which is 1 minus 1. Negative 0.58. That's the answer. For this question, I'll be the answer for these questions. And uh, hopefully that makes uh, a bit more sense for this question. This question is the easiest one on the quiz. So, um, and this is uh, a computation graph questions. I actually want to put it at the end of the session because there's actually a, um, two other interesting programming questions I really want to go through because I think that's actually a really good puzzle question <laughs> instead of, you know, program question is on the program assignment. And I see it, I was like, whoa, this is impressive. But uh, this question is essentially just derivative stuff. So you just need to start from the very back. So if you go through the lecture materials, it will pretty much be efficient for you to solve all of those questions. And there's are, then there are two of these questions on the quiz. Um, won't be, won't be, difficult. It just need you to pretty much do derivative from the back to the bottom right here. So if you have any questions, let me know. And uh, I'll go through one of these. I don't know if you have, if any of you guys have tried this before, and if you met any difficulties, let me know, and I'll go through one of those. Okay, so this is a question that I really want to get to. And because I don't have many time right here, I have to skip one of uh, some of the quiz questions. But this is a question that I really want to get to because I think this is actually one of the hardest questions uh, in the assignment, although it's question one. Um, but to get it correctly without doing Google search is actually um, take some thinking to do. And if any of you haven't taken any like digital hardware courses that require you to learn logical expressions and Boolean operations, this question will also be uh, difficult to work with. So let's actually go through um, go through some some of the concept before we actually uh, go to code it. So. And um, before I'm going into this question, does anyone have questions regarding forward passing of the neural network or actually really, really, really want me to go through one example of the computation graph? 
this one here. No? No? Cool. Seems I know what you like math. I don't too. So I kind of just jump into the programming part. <laughs> so if you guys are um, confused about the calculator stuff, I can definitely include one of those in the next lecture. But because we only have half an hour left, and I kind of want to end this early because this is two hour, and I know, and I know you guys are really tired. So uh, let's just try to have some fun with these questions. And after this, we'll um, end the sessions. And I think there's another question. Yeah, there's also an activation functions. And I kind of want to introduce my lib to you guys to kind of visualize your training results um, in the later part. I will also do that question. So after these two questions, we're done and um, you guys are free to go. But um, uh, bear with me for another 15 minutes and we, uh, we'll have some fun with this one. Okay, so if we're gonna read the questions, uh, so basically what this, do is that it asks you to um, consider, okay, consider learning the following concept with either a single layer or multi-layer perceptron. We all, we're all hidden and all the neurons utilize indicator activation functions. So um, don't confuse yourself with all of this description. So this is actually content from the week one stuff. It's asking you to produce kind of like a, a computation graph format of, of, of things. So uh, if you're, oh wait, I'm not, I'm not sharing my actual screen, am I? I am not sharing my actual screen. Okay, so for any, uh, for, <laughs> oh shoot. So if any, uh, for, for everyone who is uh, still listening, uh, jump to the slide that has the name assignment Q1 question one of the assignment. And that is the question that we're looking at. Okay, uh, jump to that question. And that question asks you to basically build a neural network with proper weights and bias that allows you to do the following logic work. Okay, so I will actually show you an example of, uh, of uh, the graph that you wanna produce. For example, if you have like input x1, and input x2, and you have like a bias term b right here, I think um, you want you to do something that's um, after summating everything at this uh, output node, out node, um, you have like bias term called like maybe one, and you do the addition process here, and you have like uh, maybe like uh, a coefficient here and you do that addition process here, and you will eventually have some sort of output. So it's asking you to produce, um, to produce um, like graph, computation graph. This is, this is a type of computation, right? It's asking you to produce graph like this to that can allow you to do the, uh, the logic gate work. So essentially the first step is that um, we need to understand what are these logic and uh, uh, we need to understand um, how exactly we can use mathematical expression to express those logic and pretty much code it out. I know it sounds cool, right? I mean, maybe, maybe you don't think that's cool, but I, I, I think that's actually really, really, really good questions about like, logic gates and, and then also it's about to perceptron. So I was like, uh, why don't we just uh, use the logic gate to kind of convert it to mathematic equations. You could just eyeball it for some of the easier questions. You could just eyeball it and do trial and error. And eventually you're pretty much arrived at your results because the coefficient is basically not gonna be larger than two because it's logic gates. But um, in this case, we would have to um, have to have to think about uh, how what's what structure of these type of um, neural network that we use. We have to think about it. Although we're handcrafting the weight instead of letting auto update, we would have to think about how many layers we we need and why we choose those type of weights. Okay, so let's go through one of the easy one, easiest one the knot. 
So if we express this by logic, this is just, uh, by the way, this is just, uh, this is just uh, extracurricular stuff. It's not, it's not mandatory for you to know about, to know anything about uh, logic gates, but I think it's, it's kind of interesting for you to see it before you actually learn it. If you're in engineering, you will learn this for sure. Like you will learn this for sure in your second year. You will learn this for sure. Okay, so this is not logic gates. So this is the input side and this is the output side. Essentially, what it means is that if we have a truth table like this, and this is the x input, okay? If we take an x input right here, and uh, we have 0 and 1, we have two types of input. 0 means false, 1 means true. And the output will essentially, you will get a 1 and a 0. So the not gate, uh, as the name suggests, is essentially just flipping just flipping the inputs into some sort of like uh, Boolean output right here. So if we're gonna use mathematical expression to do this and uh, kind of convert this to a neural network, let's think about what does a neuron do, okay? And, uh, and also the question is uh, stating that it's using an indicator, uh, it's using an indicator like activation functions and the activation, indicator activation function is basically just saying the output, if it's larger than zero, it's gonna be produce a one. And if it's smaller or equal to zero, it's gonna be zero. So it's gonna be two case. So uh, it's gonna be two case. So X, if it is larger than zero, it's gonna make X equals to one. If uh, X is smaller or equals to zero, it's gonna be x equals to zero. It essentially just means this, if x is the input, okay? Um, so let's think about what does a neuron do. So a neuron basically takes an x input and put it through first an activation functions. Uh, I just call it A. <laughs> no. yeah. um, and then you're timing a w to an x input and plus bias term to it, right? In this case, we'll just ditch the uh, activation functions because we're all doing just linear regressions um, and a one or two single layer, multi-layer perception models. And because we're using this indicator activation functions, we don't need the non-linearity. So we could just ignore these terms. So this becomes quite obvious because if you only have one input, and if you input the x here, this is essentially your output. And according to this truth table, we can actually convert it to a system of equations. I don't know if that becomes clear to your guys or not, but uh, you can essentially write it as um, a, some sort of w weight times the input plus b will equals the output. So the first thing you will get is uh, you, you only have two unknowns. So if you have two equations, two unknowns, you can solve it, right? So in this case, we'll write W times zero plus B equals to one. That's our first equation. And the second equation is W times one plus B equals to zero. And, um, by the way, I forgot to mention, because I think it's quite uh, obvious that why we're only considering, because this only works if we have like one process, process of neurons, this is a neuron. If we have to have multiple layer, this equation will no longer works because this type of, um, because you will have like X input that's consists of another like AX plus B. And that's kind of more important, uh, that's more difficult for you to, to do that because you have to like put functions inside of functions and it's, it's just more work. And then you will also have like um, confusion if you have like a large graph. But um, the reason that uh, I choose to use a single layer is that if we're saying that uh, for example, if we're doing not, I'm saying that if if it essentially I'm flipping things, so I could just express this uh, this equation or this logic using a graph like this. Like I only need this one decision boundaries to say, okay, if I say this um 
let's just give an example. Let's say if uh, if this x one, let's just use zero. Okay. If I if I uh, if it is not zero, it's a one. If it is one, it's it's not zero. So if if we if we, this this decision boundary could arbitrarily just be zero point five because uh, um, we're just uh, kind of just telling points from the two sides of the of this decision boundaries, and we're kind of just like flipping back and forth. And so one decision boundary is enough for us to solve these questions. But this is not the same for the x norm because that is definitely more difficult for us to to code because it needs two decision boundaries. But for the not, if we solve these questions, you will basically get what? You will basically get B equals to one. And because B is equals to one here, W needs to be negative one, okay? So if we form this as a neural network, as a perceptual model, it will essentially be B equals to one, equals to one. And uh, we have an input X. We're adding them together while timing this, um, while multiplying this by negative one. And we got the NOT gate. Okay. So if we're forming this type of functions, um, I would, um, I, will, I could just simply write this as, uh, as a mathematical equations. And later, uh, for, code, for the coding part, we just need to basically write this mathematical equation in the functions, and it basically solves everything, OK? OK, so let's uh, move on to part two, which is going to be a little bit harder than the first one. But uh, the third one, I'm going to leave it to yourself as a challenge because the third one is actually using two decision boundaries. And think about how you can use similar logic in, um, in XNOR. And if you cannot solve it, um, I'll, I'll first show you why XOR can be solved using, you know, uh, XOR can be solved using, um, using one decision boundaries and XNOR cannot. So if we're gonna talk about what is uh, NOR, and its truth table is gonna look so it's number two, more. It's gonna look something like this. So if you have x1 and x2, we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And we have the y output, which is the output. So it's not or. So or produce one in one in the second, third, and the fourth entry, but for nor. It only produces one for the first entry. So um, essentially, if we're gonna craft this um, in the, if we're gonna just plot this in the Cartesian plane, we'll see um, the first, the only one that produces a one that's at the origin, and uh, for zero one, oh, let me see, um, zero one, it's a zero, one zero, it's a zero, and one one, it's a zero. As a row as a result, an arbitrary decision boundary could just be something like this, you know? And it perfectly split the two set of points. Does that make sense? And that's exactly why I can use the function that I, the, the method that I described above to solve this type of questions. So following that, we can form a system of equation again. And the, because we have two input right here, We'll just integrate, uh, we'll just um, write the whole expression as w equals to w1, uh, sorry, y equals to w1 time x1 plus w2 time x2 plus b. Why I only have one bias term? Because it will be exactly the same thing if we have two. Um, adding two constant vertical shift is equal to adding one bigger vertical shift. And because we only have one decision layer, these, uh, these bias doesn't have the possibility of multiplying to other like coefficient and stuff. So the summing them together will definitely be functional. So um, this, this will greatly simplify your, um, your whole questions because right here, if you have to zero, you could just figure out the total vertical shift term is one. So I could just, so from this equation, I could just uh, write y equals to 
zero times W1 plus zero times W2 plus one. Uh, and that's equals to one, sorry, whoops. That's equals to one. And we can have other similar equation like this too. And um, I could have zero equals to zero time um, W1 plus one time W2 plus one, uh, plus B, sorry, plus B, whoops. <laughs> plus B and blah, 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 okay? And you can go ahead and solve this equation. It will take you less than one minute and you can get an expression that gives you the NOR gates, okay? And uh, for an X NOR, um, I will not go into the detail of the truth table, but if you uh, encounter difficulties of uh, analyzing the Boolean expressions, um, search on YouTube for the, um, for the method of product of sum and uh, so, or sum of products. Um, if you're in second year, you probably are learning this right now. And uh, this basically, two, this two concept allows you to do what? It allows you to simplify Boolean expressions using a truth table. So you simplify, simplify, simplify um, Boolean expressions uh, using truth table, okay? It allows you to come up with um, basically an equation quickly that allows you to basically uh, do the above analysis, okay? But I will just show you briefly why this cannot be done with one decision boundaries, because if I graph, got to graph this on the diagram right here, okay? For me to look like, uh, so the third one is X nor. So the X nor's uh, truth table looks something like this. X nor, it's one and it's two. We have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And uh, X nor produce one when X one, X two are the same. So it's essentially X nor means not X or. X or only produce a one when um, X one and X two are not the same, but uh, X nor produce uh, one where X one and X two are the same. I don't know if that confused you guys. Um, this is straight out of EC 241. Yes, this is straight out of EC 241. Uh, but uh, I was, I was like so surprised to see this actually to be <laughs> on this coding assignment because it actually required people to know a little bit about the Boolean expression to understand it. But for the um, for the like top two questions, I managed to do it without using too much Boolean algebra. But uh, the third one, it will be actually easier for you to go through POS and SLP because that way you can solve this question really quickly. Otherwise, you're going to go through a lot of like embedded functions and solving a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, system equations, which is uh, pretty tedious. But in this case, if we got to plot this on this uh, Cartesian plane, we can see that x1, and x2 produce a one. I'll use a bright color, so that's on the origin, and uh, one one will also produce a one. So I'll just arbitrarily say, okay, this is one. Okay. And then I'll choose a darker color to see, and this is produces zero, this is produces zero. Okay. So now let's see, if we're only wanting um, these two to be included, it's impossible for us to draw two lines to separate these two from our correct boundary. For example, like this, or we can draw it like something like, um, like this, right? We have to have two decision boundaries to enable the work. Otherwise, there's no way for us to completely separate these two um, expressions. Uh, I mean, uh, these two, I mean, group of, group of outputs. So that's why X nor is much more complicated because it cannot be simply solved using, you know, one set of uh, linear equations and it work because uh, for X nor, you essentially need to put more thoughts into it and actually analysis and analyze the truth table 
to produce um, produce um, the actual Boolean expression. But uh, for anyone who um, does not have the time, I will just write down the Boolean expression right here. Um, time x2. So if we actually have the time, this question could take me like half an hour to completely go through it. But here I, 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 would, I would just put the, I would just put the expression here so that uh, you can just uh, do the easier work and you know, um, hopefully complete the, the, the assignment. <laughs> so here, um, if we see the x1 times x2, for anyone who have learned logic gates, this expression is straightly shouting and gates to you. And I know people who are taking 241 have a midterm coming next week. So <laughs> if you're interested, you can also do these questions. So this is and, and for x1 plus x2, um, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you guys are seeing this function, this is actually a nor. Okay. So what is a nor? Uh, is not or. <laughs> so or is uh, or is x1 plus x2. Nor means that it only produces um, the all complete opposite result of or. So it only produces one when both of the entries are zero. Um, yeah. Is it nor? Or am I am I making a mistake? Yeah, this is yeah. And uh, this summation here produce an OR gate. So essentially this one question requires you to do like, like three, three simplified version of, uh, of, of what we did with question one and two right there. So you need to first compute the end, end result between X1 and X2 and compute the NOR result with, uh, with X1 and X2 uh, opposite. And then you do OR. When you do the finish the war, you get uh, the right truth table representation, which is uh, one zero zero one. Okay, so I know I've been pretty much talking a lot about uh, how this function will work out. Let's actually see the code to work because we don't have much time right now. When we have ten minutes, we'll just end after these questions because the next question is just simply visualizing these functions. I could just show you one example of those uh, and then I could just code it out because it would be pretty quick. Um, but I just kind of want to show you how to use Matplotlib to visualize those scatter plot. But uh, otherwise, um, you're, we're going to end pretty soon. Okay, trust me, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be speeding this up. Okay. Ooh, okay. Uh, let's try to make this on the left of the screen so I can actually show you guys. One. Okay. Can you guys see my coding interface right now? We're just coded, we're just gonna code this really, really fast. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Hopefully you guys find that question a bit more interesting than, than the easy questions uh from week one. Uh, I actually find this uh, really entertaining. I had a lot of time with it. Uh, I, I I spent like two minutes on it and I was like, well, this is actually kind of interesting. So I decided to include in the lectures. Um, nobody requested, but I re uh, <laughs> included it anyways. But uh, okay. So this is homework um, one and problem one. Problem one. Problem one. Okay. So um, first, uh, I need the indicated functions anyways, because we want to, because we produce, because it did say that uh, if we we're using activation functions, otherwise uh, it won't be pretty, it won't be neural network. It will just be a set of linear regressions with multiple layers. Uh, but for neural network to work, it does need to have an activation function, although this is not quite an activation function, but it's capping it between uh, the value of zero and one is not continuous, uh, but it it is uh, it is an uh, activation function. I'll just say it's an indicator indicator function, and it will take inputs. And essentially, um, what I'm saying is, uh, if input is smaller or equal to zero, uh, I'm going to return zero. 
and uh, else I'm going to return one. Okay. And uh, does anybody have confusion regarding the this uh, activation functions? I can't see the chair. Okay. Nope. Okay. Everybody is clear at this point. Okay. So let's do the not first. Let's do the not first. So if you still remember our discussion around how not can be um, composed using a set of uh, linear linear calculations, we'll just simply do uh, to find not. By the way, if you're doing correct uh, coding conversion, you're not supposed to uh, capitalize your, I mean, except you use cam case, but um, usually use it for some, uh, from uh, for like a fixed uh, constant or stuff, but I don't. I mean, it's, it's it's in the question, so I just capitalize. So I do return, but I need an uh, activation function. So I call the indicator functions uh, to um, basically include our summation product. So um, I'm just gonna do x one because. As we discussed from the first question, the not gate simply is um, x plus b with a equals to negative one and b equals to one. So in this case, I could just a equals to negative one plus one. And you can also separately define outside of this function. Oops. You can also uh, define outside of this function be like, um, okay, w equals to negative one, uh, negative one, whoops, negative one and b equals to one. You could do that. So that uh, it's, it's better practice and it's clearer for you, but you, you can also write these functions in one line, okay? And essentially this will return the results uh, for your not gates and uh, pretty much pretty much one line. And uh, this is a, what they call a neural network, but uh, it's handcrafted and it does not allow weight update to happen. So it's not quite a neural network. But uh, because for the time's sake, let's just see how we can test it, okay? How we can test this um, simple not gate. So if we do if name equals to main. Uh, by the way, I probably will not include this much content in the next session. So it's a, uh, I'll make it as far as possible. So if anyone has any like in interesting questions uh, for me, just simply just uh, send it to me through email and uh, I'll just focus on what people are interested in, other than just doing this uh, all random stuff. Okay, so let's try with uh, zero and one, one zero, sorry. Uh, we can also try with like some other uh, value like 1.4 so that it's capped to uh, zero, hopefully. And um, we also try with other value like negative uh, 0 0.5. Let's do that. And uh, um, how we can do this is that because we're not using a NumPy array, this time we actually have to use uh, for loop. So for i in range of uh, test not. So if I make any mistake, pardon me, because I am literally not, uh, okay. And not gates, not gates. And I will just pass the test not. Gates. Test not, test not, and I. Okay. And uh, hopefully, what we see is exactly what the truth table will produce us, which is um, this is one, and this is a, another one. I know it's 1.4, but it will be capped to one. And this is a negative 0 0.5, so this will produce zero. So hopefully, what we'll see at the end uh, when, we print, when we print this main block is. Zero zero one one. Okay, I uh, and let's run this. Yeah, congratulations, this works. Okay, <laughs> and uh, okay. So um, let's just do uh, because the second one will also be relatively easy. Um, let's just do the third one coding. So I. I was uh, I haven't told you guys so what the coefficient is, but essentially you don't need a coefficient because um, because if you have all of the expressions out, uh, as Bo I just said, it's composed of a uh, nor and and or. So it's a uh, 
it's after you end nor to um to include variables you're using the or gate to com compose everything together so um a better uh, rather than just rat just writing like equations in your functions it's better for you to like practice writing different logic gate uh, using functions and kind of just compose them together in one function such that you don't have to double check your equations but in this case because we're Definitely running out of time. I will just uh, whoops, copy and paste <laughs> what I have what I have from uh, yesterday. Uh, copy and paste what I have from yesterday. Okay, so I have a NOR gate, an end gate, and OR gate coded now. These are just one decision boundary. So these are just one line functions like this. And for X NOR. It's essentially just you're computing the end result using an end gate, and you're coding, you're um, calculating the NOR results using the NOR gate, and basically you're just returning the OR results of, of the end result and the NOR results. So it's 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 very simple because in this functions we're just operating with Boolean expressions instead of uh, just doing pure math like these. So we don't have to compose this from the very beginning. We could just recycle the code, you know. That's kind of cool, right? And uh, and because we already include the uh, indication function in it, we don't have to include it again outside of the or. Although if you include it, it won't do anything. So, um, so in order to test those, I could use the following code. Actually, I don't have it, so I have to run it myself. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> We'll just toss, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just test uh, more gates. So for I range, I could just recycle them, but uh, um, I would need another test. Uh, test. So I have zero, zero, and uh, I will have um, zero, one. I will have one, zero, and uh, I will have one, one. Sorry, guys, um, if you if you're busy, you're free to leave. And uh, this will probably take me another like three minutes to complete. And after that, um, uh, the session will be ended. Sorry for going over time, but uh, next time I promise I won't include so many stuff because I'm, I'm being way too greedy. I, <laughs> I wanna include too much. Uh, I, I wanna include as useful, like many useful content as possible, but uh, um, I think I screwed myself up, sorry. Um, so I create a test case right now. If you just going back to the truth table in your, in your notebook, this will exactly be the input of the truth table. As you see, this is zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Okay. So at the end, uh, uh what we want to produce is that we want to produce one, zero, zero, one, according to this. So one, zero, zero, one, you can also use unit test, but in this case, I'm just printing it out because it's faster. And uh, I'll just do min of test, okay? So I'm going through the lens of the test and going, going through the list one by one. And uh, I'll just uh, print it out, print out, print out, print, okay. Print out x more, x more, and it take two inputs. In this case, I will need the x uh, list right here. And uh, I will need to input that 